Hi Internet! Welcome to the Gretron YouTube channel. To celebrate the release of Final Fantasy 16, I decided to release 16 videos ranking the Final Fantasy games in a variety of categories. Each game has their strengths and weaknesses, so I thought it would be a fun way to compare and contrast the games. These lists are just my personal opinion, trying to balance objectivity and personal preference, and likely failing to satisfy anybody. So, if you disagree with my ranking, which you probably do, let me know your ranking of the subject in the comments below. In this video, I'll be ranking the main party of each game. A big part of the appeal of Final Fantasy games is the idea of the hero character gathering allies to fight against the forces of darkness. Because you know what's stronger than the forces of darkness? The power of friendship! A strong cast generally leads to a stronger narrative, and thus the party members one encounters throughout the game ends up having a big impact on the experience. For these rankings, I'm going to mainly focus on characters that the player ends up controlling over the course of their journey, but I'll also factor in significant NPCs. For the MMOs, since I'm not ranking the expansion pack content, I'm going to focus on characters that fit the narrative role of party member in the base game, even if you can't actually have them in your party over the course of the adventure, due to the nature of the game's design. While yes, they might join you for a fight or two and the trust system in Eleven technically lets you summon characters whenever you want, I figured this would be a more coherent way to discuss the characters. I'm a story guy first, so I'm going to look more at character writing than gameplay mechanics, though I may factor it in when necessary. Okay, now that we've got that out of the way, let's rank the party members and cast in the Final Fantasy games. Number 16, Final Fantasy 1. Final Fantasy 1 stars the four Warriors of Light. They are nameless, voiceless, generic party members with no personality. Each supporting character is as much a main character as the quote-unquote main character because they're just whatever character classes the player chooses, and whatever names the player gives them. While the character classes have striking, iconic designs, there's basically nothing here in terms of characterization. They show up from out of nowhere and just begin the quest. There are lots of unanswered questions. Where did the heroes come from? Why are they just starting the adventure now? Who exactly are they? You get none of that in Final Fantasy 1. The Warrior of Light got an interesting redesign in later releases, as an amalgamation of the four Warriors of Light all into one, but there's not much to him or the original Warriors of Light. All you get is Heroes Save World. That's it. It's a very easy last place on this list. Number 15, Final Fantasy 3. Final Fantasy 3, like Final Fantasy 1, stars four nameless Warriors of Light. However, the characters have actual dialogue and the faintest hints of personalities and backstories. In the original version of the game, you play as four young Onion Knights from the village of Ur. All four of them are orphans who grew up together in the village but wonder about their mysterious past and where they are from originally. This is already far more to work with than Final Fantasy 1, where the four Warriors of Light just show up, don't say anything, and just start questing. This game gives the Onion Knights an actual inciting incident, a call to adventure, and the characters decide through dialogue to answer the call. With that alone, it's enough to rank above Final Fantasy 1. But the 3D version adds even more characterization. The four nameless Onion Knights are no longer nameless Onion Knights with largely the same design. Now, each of the four main characters has a name, distinct design, backstory, and personality. Instead of four nameless Onion Knights, you now have Luneth, an adventurous boy from the village of Ur and his bookish best friend Ark. Refia, the adopted daughter of the village of Taka's blacksmith who wants more from life than simply following in the family business and Ingus, noble and honor-bound soldier of Sasane. Each of them has a distinct personality, unique dialogue, and honest-to-goodness character arcs. The remake is admittedly thin on the characterization, though, as they still wanted to keep a lot of the feel of the original game's story. There are also guest characters that join the party temporarily, and in the remake even participate in battles to a degree. The guest characters actually have a decent amount of personality and help the story feel fresh. There are seven guest characters the player will meet over the course of Final Fantasy III's journey. There's Princess Sarah, Sid, Desh, Arya, Alice, Doga, and Une. All of them contribute to the story, and all of them are pretty likable with distinct personalities. Combine them with our four leads, and you've got a full-fledged Final Fantasy cast, though the entire group is never actively traveling together. The remake's characterization offers a significant step up from the original version of III, which was a significant step up from Final Fantasy I, making Final Fantasy III easily surpass Final Fantasy I on this list. Number 14, Final Fantasy XI. Final Fantasy XI is an MMO, and if I wanted to be facetious, I could say that your party members are the people you play with online, and they could potentially be your highest ranked party in the entire series because of the real, genuine friendships you make with people through playing the game. I respect that from a video game playing perspective, but from a narrative perspective it literally does nothing for me, so I'm going to focus on the quote-unquote party members in Eleven's base game. 
And yes, you could just summon AI trust as your party members, but I'm going to focus on the characters who fit the role of party member in the story. Final Fantasy XI stars an adventurer created by the player who emigrates to a new nation in an attempt to rise through the ranks and increase their standing in their new home. The motivation you ascribe to your player character is up to you. There's not as much story for the player character in Base XI as there is in Final Fantasy III, but there's more than Final Fantasy I. Admittedly, Base XI doesn't have too much of a supporting cast, and the only two characters who could really fill the role of party member in the Shadow Lord saga are Lion and Zade, as they're the only characters who are actively out with you during stretches of the adventure. Both of them are actually pretty great characters. Lion is a no-nonsense thief raised by pirates, and Zaid is a dark knight running from his haunting past. However, most of their character development is in the expansions, so they don't offer much in the base game in terms of characterization. While Eleven has some amazing characters like Chantoto, Prish, and Arcelia, most of the great character work comes in the expansion packs. So, it's really just looking at Lion and Zaid, who are ultimately more interesting than the cast in 3, especially in the 2D version, and thus rank above them. Number 13, Final Fantasy XIV, A Realm Reborn. Like Final Fantasy XI, Final Fantasy XIV doesn't have traditional party members like in other Final Fantasy games, and instead relies on you teaming up with other players. You once again play as a player-created character, and like XI, you play an up-and-coming adventurer looking to make a name for yourself. However, unlike XI, you're also the Warrior of Light, and the NPCs who act in the role of party members are given much more characterization and much more active roles in the plot of the base game than Lion or Zaid. In A Realm Reborn, the player character works with an organization known as the Scions of the Seventh Dawn. Depending on which nation you start in depends on which of these members will get the most screen time in A Realm Reborn. If you start in Ulda, Thancred will be the Scion you interact with the most often. If you start in Gadania, you'll see a lot more of Ida and Papalimo. If Limsa Lominsa is your starting location, you'll end up seeing more of Yastola. Once you get to a certain point in the game, you'll see them a bit more evenly alongside the leader Minfilia and other members like Alphano. While none of them are particularly great in base 14, except for possibly Thancred, the characters have a decent amount of screen time to allow you to get more attached to them than the cast in previous games. They feel more like active allies joining you on adventure than the passerby party members in base 11. I've heard that the bonding with these characters grows greatly in later expansions, and that a number of players have fallen in love with Yastola. I haven't gotten to those parts yet, but she's fine in A Realm Reborn. Nothing special, at least at this point in the narrative. Like 11, 14 gets the same handicap of only ranking the base game to make it a fairer fight with the other titles. And because I wanted to get these videos done before 16 comes out because I can't afford a PS5 and probably won't play 16 for a few years. The cast in A Realm Reborn is certainly stronger than those below it on the list, but based only on A Realm Reborn, it's still not a top tier Final Fantasy cast. Number 12, Final Fantasy 2. Final Fantasy 2 was the first game in the series to have defined party members with names, unique character designs, and specific backstories. Firion, Maria, Guy, and Leon are all teenagers from the village of Finn, who are forced to flee when their town is destroyed by the fearsome Palamecian Empire. Leon ultimately disappears in the chaos, leaving Firion, Maria, and Guy as refugees with nothing other than the clothes on their backs and a burning desire to avenge their lost loved ones. Firion and Maria are admittedly a little generic without much character development outside of their inciting motivation, but they aren't completely one note. Firion is known to have a weakness for pretty girls, and Maria is incredibly compassionate. Guy is your typical gentle giant archetype. All of them deeply care for one another and have a strong desire to find the missing Leon. While Firion, Maria, and Guy are always in your party, the fourth spot is occupied by a rotating guest character, and those characters are easily the highlights of the cast. There's Minwu, the mysterious wizard, Joseph, a bare knuckle brawler who just wants to live a peaceful life as a family man that gets drawn into the rebel cause, Gordon, the youngest prince of Kashwan, who must learn to act as a leader after his brother's untimely demise. Rickard, the last of a long line of warriors known as Dragoons, desperate to make sure his people's legacy isn't for naught. Layla, a swashbuckling pirate who plays by her own rules. And Leon, whose role in the story is more complicated than one might think upon first glance. This is actually a really strong cast of characters. There's a good balance of personalities and interesting visual designs where no two characters feel like they occupy the same role in the narrative. Each of them feels unique and adds something to the story with their arcs, and they fit the world they're in perfectly. The only real weakness in this cast is that the three leads feel ultimately more generic, thus bringing the overall quality down a little bit. But that's mostly due to the fact that Final Fantasy II was originally a NES game with limited space for the script. For the era, this is an incredible cast. If we got a remake with some more characterization, I could see this cast ranking higher, because there's a ton of potential here. But the remakes we've gotten have been generally conservative in their additions to the characterization of the three teenage leads, and thus, this is where the cast of Final Fantasy II ends up in the ranking. Number 11, Final Fantasy V. Final Fantasy V has a pretty weak cast overall. 
Bart, Lena, and Creele are pretty bland. Gallif is somewhat funny with his amnesiac personality, but he's not super memorable overall. There is one character in Final Fantasy V, however, who is absolutely a top-tier character for the series, and elevates the cast solely on their shoulders. I'm talking about the pirate captain, Ferris. Ferris is an incredible character with tons of personality, a great character arc, fun pattern of speech, and excellent design. Everything you want from a Final Fantasy party member is here. Ferris has a fascinating origin story, and seeing them grow from ruthless cutthroat to someone willing to open their heart to others and selflessly fight to save the world is a fantastic one. I think a lot of people forget what a great character Ferris is because of the weaker cast surrounding the feisty pirate, and thus 5 is elevated to the number 11 spot solely thanks to the greatness of the dread pirate Ferris. Number 10, Final Fantasy XII. The cast of Final Fantasy XII gets a lot of criticism for being one of the weaker cast in the series, but it honestly isn't that bad. Vaughn and Pinello are better than they're typically given credit for. They're both likable and have well-defined personalities, even if they don't have that much relevance to the overall plot. Both of them are generally endearing and likable presences on screen, and add a touch of youthful optimism and naivete to the party that helps lighten the overall mood and allow for more seasoned adventurers to offer exposition to the player. Vaughn does have a good early game arc involving Bosch that's actually pretty well written, but that's kind of the end of his character development. Bosch and Balthier are both great characters, though there are severe flaws in the writing and pacing of their character arcs in the game. When I played Final Fantasy XII, casually without doing side quests and just playing through the main story, there was an 8 hour stretch where Bosch didn't have a single line of dialogue. Yes, I did maybe 2 hours of grinding in there, but still, 6 hours of gameplay and cutscenes, where the guy who was originally written as the main character doesn't utter a single word? Yikes! He has a good character arc, but it feels a little undercooked. Balthier is great though. 10 out of 10 characters, zero complaints. Lots of charm and charisma. I'm not big on his design, and he feels more like the guy who tells everybody he's good looking rather than a guy who's actually good looking, but he has enough confidence to pull it off. Perfect character, love Balthier, one of the best in the series. Fran is solid for basically being a sexy bunny girl version of Chewbacca mixed with the tropes of an ethereal Lord of the Rings forest elf. She compliments Balthier well, so while she's probably not even in my top 20 Final Fantasy characters, she's not bad either. She's solid. Ash doesn't do much for me as a character, but I see the appeal. Her arc basically boils down to how far are you willing to go to get what you want, but she feels a little one note to me. Or rather than one note, they hit the same character beat too many times in a row where she feels one note. Not bad in concept. She didn't vibe with me personally, but I definitely wouldn't call her a bad character. What's really weird is that the guest character Larsa is one of the best characters in the game, and the fact he's not a permanent party member makes sense for story reasons, but it's a bummer that he's not around more because he might actually be the best written playable character in the game. Aside from Balthier, of course. Overall, 12's cast is a solid, middle-of-the-road, average-quality Final Fantasy cast. Some stronger characters, some weaker ones, but overall pretty good. Number 9, Final Fantasy Tactics. The cast of Final Fantasy Tactics is generally underdeveloped compared to a lot of other Final Fantasy games, as most of the focus is on the overarching plot and the lead character Ramza's development over the course of the story. Ramza is a great lead character to center the story around. He's Captain America. He's Superman. He's the morally righteous, unmovable rock. A hero of black and white in a world of gray. He never compromises his morals and always does the right thing. And in a story as dark as tactics, he is a beacon of light the player becomes attracted to like a moth to a flame. A true man for all seasons. The other party members in Final Fantasy Tactics generally fall into one of two camps. In one camp, you have generic recruits who have no dialogue or characterization. They share character sprites, and while you can customize each of them to feel incredibly unique, they don't offer anything in terms of narrative. I like to headcanon some of these characters that have been with Ramza since his early military school days and follow him to the depths of hell and what their relationship with the generally friendly and kind-hearted Ramza is like, but none of that is contained within the text of the game's narrative. The other kind of party member is more in the traditional Final Fantasy mold. A named character with a unique bat story, motivations, personality, and striking design. Most of these characters begin as guest characters in battle, and over time, some will join your party permanently. However, because this game has permadeath, any character that joins your party generally stops all character development and involvement in the main story once they become a permanent party member, leading to a lot of the cast feeling underdeveloped by the end of the story. That's not to say there aren't some great characters in the game. While Argoth and Delita never fully join your team, they are two of the best written characters in the entire Final Fantasy series, easily. Without getting into spoilers, the way these characters so drastically change from your initial impression of them is both believable and incredibly engaging. But let's look at the characters who will permanently join you. Some will join you through the main story, and others through side quests, but let's look at what Tactics has to offer. There's Agrias, the holy knight with a strong sense of honor and duty. She's pretty great and really likable. Thunder God Sid is the most overpowered party member in the series and is a complete and total badass. Love him. 
Mustadio is an instantly likable gun-wielding machinist who likes to repair ancient technology. And he never becomes a jerk, which is nice. Rafa and Mark are a pair of siblings with a really tragic and mature backstory that ends up being incredibly engaging. Boko is a chocobo you save from monsters. He's cool. He's a chocobo. Beowulf and Race have a fun little side arc that gets some nice expansion in the PSP port. Construct 8 is a robot. That's about all there is to him. Biblos is a weird creature you get after going through a really weird but cool dungeon that offers the only real exploration in the game, but you don't really know what his deal is other than that he lives in this weird dark dungeon that an insane wizard also lives in. And there's guest characters from other Final Fantasy games, and yes, they become full-fledged party members. Cloud from Final Fantasy VII was in the original version of Tactics, but for the PSP port they also added in Balthier from XII and Luso from Final Fantasy Tactics A2, the third game in the Tactics series, as playable characters also. All three of them are really great characters in their respective games. Luso is super underrated, but nobody knows that because nobody played A2. But in Tactics, they don't really get too much development. Again, everyone has their cool little introduction arc, and then they proceed to contribute nothing else to the story. Except for Mustadio, because he's tied into so many of the side quests. So, all in all, the cast of Tactics is actually really good, but the structure of the game really hampers the amount of development a lot of the characters are allowed. Number 8. Final Fantasy XV Final Fantasy XV's cast has been jokingly referred to as a boy band. You've got Noctis, the moody one, Gladio, the rugged one, there's Ignis, the reserved one with glasses, and there's Prompto, the funny one, and they're all really pretty with nice clothes and great hair. Yes, the main cast of Final Fantasy XV is a boy band. But, boy bands are great. They're eternal. From the Beatles to BTS, boy bands have proven time and time again they're also the best bands. Joking aside, but not really, the Beatles and BTS are great. XV focuses most of the game on the small cast of four, and it's actually to their benefit. You spend so much time with these four characters, and there's tons of in-game dialogue between the four of them as you traverse through the game world. The strength of their characterization comes from less traditional cutscenes, but more from the banter and the day-to-day -day smaller moments in the game, making the four leads really feel like close friends. So while it's easy to write off the leads as tropey, they actually are fleshed out and very believable characters. I think Nottis is a strong lead, and his three companions bounce off him in well-balanced ways. These aren't characters meeting for the first time. They're friends with years of history going on a road trip, and then ultimately finding themselves on a quest to save the world. Their shorthand between the characters, and their unique relationships with one another, is what makes them feel so very real. There are a few guest characters who temporarily join the party, two of which I think are pretty good, and one I think is kind of meh. Kor was clearly meant to be a more important character in an earlier draft of the game, but he comes off as pretty boring. But Iris is a generally charming and endearing character full of bright, optimistic energy, and RNA's dry wit mixed with her nuanced relationship with the Empire adds a great layer to the party dynamics during her brief tenure with the group. The theme song for the game, a cover of Stand By Me performed by Florence and the Machine, perfectly encapsulates the strongest aspect of Final Fantasy XV, which is the bond between the four male leads. It's one of the greatest bromances in video game history, and it's refreshing to see four guys just genuinely love each other and bro out. XV's cast is really great. Number 7, Final Fantasy VIII Final Fantasy VIII's cast is better than you might think upon first glance. Most Final Fantasy games offer varied backstories for their cast members, and vignettes that focus on each party member as they join the team. And beyond that, they usually have some kind of character arc that gets resolved later in the game. Final Fantasy VIII has a plot twist that unfortunately doesn't really allow for this to happen in the game's narrative. The twist itself is infamously terrible, purely from a lore and compelling storytelling standpoint, but the fact that it also robbed us of greater character development for the cast makes its inclusion even more of a facepalm in retrospect. The game instead chooses to focus on the character arcs of our male and female leads, Squall and Renoa, whereas the rest of the cast gets largely relegated to the sidelines. That said, in spite of those flaws, Final Fantasy VIII actually has a really great cast overall. The characters have striking designs and vibrant personalities. Zell, Irvine, Quistus, and Selfie are all great characters. Laguna is absolutely fantastic. Renoa is... fine, I guess. Squall is a unique and distinct protagonist, and whether you like him or not, he is a well-developed character. He's very much an emo boy frustrated with his co-workers, but damn it, you believe he's an emo boy frustrated with his co-workers. Final Fantasy VIII's cast is one of the better ones in the series, but sadly a lot of choices in the narrative prevent the characters from reaching their full potential. Still, their charm and charisma is able to carry the story enough to keep you continually interested, which is impressive given how bad most of the narrative actually is. Number 6, Final Fantasy XIII We've got another controversial cast from another controversial game. A lot of people really hate the cast from this game. 
Fans complain about Snow being a himbo, Hope being unreasonable and whiny, Lightning being too cold and distant, and on a more surface level, people don't like Vanille because of the voice direction. A lot of fans don't like how adversarial the cast is with one another for a good chunk of the game, constantly arguing and fighting with one another instead of coming together as a team. I get all that, but I really think this cast is great. First off, the visual design of each character is truly striking. After the more bland character designs of 12s, the vibrancy of Nomura's designs felt like a breath of fresh air. But this is all surface level stuff. How's the writing? One of the biggest strong suits of 13's cast is what I refer to as a character web. Each member of the cast has a strong personality and strong opinions, and those opinions don't just extend to the world around them, but also to how they feel about other party members. Snow's relationship with Lightning is vastly different than his relationship with Hope, and Lightning's relationship with Hope is vastly different than the one she has with Snow. Saz's relationship with Vanille is very different than her relationship with Fang. This constant crisscross of relationships is fascinating to watch and continually keeps the dynamics interesting. In other JRPGs, characters may go on an adventure together, but any two characters in any given party will have no reason to directly interact or really have much to say to one another. Try to describe to me the relationship between Celis and Umaro. Then try to describe to me the relationship between Snow and Hope. Which of them is more interesting? I'll wait. 13 does a great job with its cast by really taking advantage of having different dynamics between different groupings of characters, painting a rich tapestry that few other games in the series do as well. It's the biggest strength of a cast that's already strong, and the party rightfully earns the number 6 spot on this list. Number 5, Final Fantasy VI. Final Fantasy VI has an incredible cast of iconic characters. Many Western fans feel this is the strongest cast in the series. Fan favorites like Terra, Celis, Locke, Setzer, Edgar, Sabin, and Shadow are beloved by the community and are legends of the JRPG genre. Final Fantasy VI even has a Moogle, Mog, as a permanent party member. What's not to love? Well, the cast is a little bit bloated. It's the biggest in the main series, boasting 14 possible permanent party members, and not all of them are created equal. For every Terra there's a Strago, for every Celis a Yumaro, for every Locke a Gogo. That's not to say there's not a certain charm to the fact that you can have a Yeti, a Mime, a Moogle, and a wild feral boy join you on a quest to stop an evil clown, but a lot of the characters don't add much to the story and are just kinda there. Though I acknowledge that Gao has some depth, don't at me. Final Fantasy VI is often praised for having no main character. Fans argue it's an ensemble piece similar to Game of Thrones. In my opinion, that's mostly incorrect. Terra is the main character up until the World of Ruin, and then Celis is the main character from that point onward. There are different sections when other characters take the lead, but is anyone going to say that Sid or Tifa is also the lead character in Final Fantasy VII because you control them for a scenario or two? No, of course not. And so the leads of this game are Terra and Celis. They're the focal points of the story, and the narrative revolves around those two. Personally, I'm not big on Terra as a character. Her arc of how do I people does not resonate with me. I wasn't a kid who had trouble talking to people or making friends. I was social, charming, and generally agreeable, able to make all kinds of different friends from different walks of life fairly effortlessly. Terra trying to understand basic human emotions and develop relationships with others just doesn't strike a chord with me. I can't relate to it. But I can see how a bunch of socially awkward JRPG kids would vibe with her story. I get it. I really do. And I don't think it's inherently bad to write a character like that, but I don't find the way they wrote her personality to be interesting, and I don't think her arc is particularly interesting either. Celis, in contrast, I think is a much better character than Terra, and I think the game would be better if they were combined into a single character. While they do have a couple nice scenes together where they serve as foils, I don't think those scenes are strong enough to justify having both of them in the game. The cast is already bloated, as mentioned previously. Both Terra and Celis are female magic-infused soldiers escaping the Empire and branded as traitors. It wouldn't take too much to blend their narratives. Celis is introduced to the player after already having defected from the Empire and being tortured, but we never see the reason why she decided to leave and have her change of heart. I don't think this is a weakness of her character per se, but it's a flaw not to show that to the player in the same way it's a flaw in Final Fantasy VIII not to give the supporting cast stronger character arcs. To compare and contrast, look at Cecil from Final Fantasy IV. Cecil was a character we got to see come to grips with his sins and defect from his loyalties. Celis is lacking that, and I think she'd be a far stronger character if we got to see that part of her arc. In many ways, Celis feels like a prototype for Beatrix from Nine who is basically the same character but done better in my estimation, despite having less screen time. And for those who argue that Cecil is a main character, and thus it's not fair to compare him and Celis, I would argue Tella from Final Fantasy IV has much stronger written character motivation than Celis does. Also, I really need to get this off my chest. I'm a musician. I've primarily done rock music, but I've done jazz, film score work, and was at one time a member of an orchestra. I have trouble suspending disbelief with the opera scene. 
I can handle magic and fantastical creatures, steampunk robots and evil clowns, but an untrained musician who never even sang before carrying an entire opera? That's like asking someone who's never even heard of basketball to play against the 1996 Chicago Bulls, Solo. For the Pixel Remaster soundtrack, Uematsu attempted to fix the storytelling awkwardness by having the singers for Celis not singing in an opera style so as to sound untrained, but he only supervised the English and Japanese versions of the scene. The game was translated into several other languages, and those opera singers sound very professional, once again robbing the disbelief of the scene. For all previous versions of the game, Celis' skill level as a singer is left ambiguous, and it definitely is a feels-over-real situation. Credit to Dude McGuy and Derek Pansiera for pointing out this fact to me. Final Fantasy VI has a cast I ultimately tend to find a tad overrated, but that doesn't mean I don't love a lot of these characters. There's still a top 5 Final Fantasy cast, but given the rabid nature of the VI fanbase, I felt I had to share my justification and reasoning as to why they didn't get the number 1 spot on this list. It's an all-time great RPG cast, but there are some weak spots due to the size of the cast, and there are other casts that simply resonate with me more. Number 4, Final Fantasy X. Final Fantasy X has a unique take on a Final Fantasy cast. Most of the games involve characters slowly joining the party over the course of the adventure. In Final Fantasy X, the vast majority of the party ends up joining at the same time, and most of the cast have pre-established relationships that began long before the events of the game. Yuna, Lulu, Waka, and Kimari have all lived in the same village for years and planned on going on their quest together for quite some time, and they were all familiar with Orin from years ago as well. All of them knew or knew of Titus' father, and Titus also knew Orin before the events of the game. And then there's Riku, who may join the party a little later, but she already had a pre-established connection to Yuna. Though Titus has his relationship with Orin, he's definitely the odd man out in the party, coming to the world of spirit as an outsider with no knowledge of the society and culture. His isekai storyline is perfect for offering exposition to the player without feeling forced, and his personality is incredibly believable. Yuna acts as a great foil to him, and their romantic attraction to one another is, again, believable. You can see how a goody-goody conservative girl would be attracted to the blonde athlete hunk who appeared from out of nowhere, especially when they're both hormonal teenagers. It's not purely lust, though, and they do develop a genuine connection that's beautiful and endearing. Waka is another really great character. He's very complex, human, and realistic. Sadly, I think a lot of us have someone in our lives who we know has a good and loving heart, but has been tricked by xenophobia and religious dogma to adopt some bigoted attitudes. The fact that we get introduced to Waka in such a loving, sweet, and endearing manner before seeing the darker side of his personality really complicates the player's feelings on his character. But it's so satisfying to see him grow past his biases, open his mind, and become a better person. Every member of Ten's cast is extremely strong with distinct personalities, but it's also very believable that this group would end up traveling together. None of it feels forced and the execution is spot on. Final Fantasy X has a perfect cast. Honestly, these top four are really close to each other in terms of quality, and it's really just slight personal preference dictating the ranking. Number 3, Final Fantasy IX Final Fantasy IX's cast is near perfect, but it is most definitely not perfect. However, as great as the constant quality of X's cast is, IX's cast simply has higher highs. The starting party of Zidane, Vivi, Garnet, and Steiner is the best four-person party in the series, and has by far the best inter-party dynamics of any group of Final Fantasy characters. Like 13, the character web of relationships is full of vibrancy and life. Steiner treats Vivi with absolute respect, while he thinks Zidane is nothing but a scoundrel. Meanwhile, Steiner is doing his best to convince Princess Garnet to follow his guidance while remaining steadfast and loyal. Garnet, however, has a flirtatious, blossoming romance with the rogue Zidane, who is also doing his best to act as an older brother figure and role model for young Vivi. The chemistry between these four is off the charts brilliant, and nothing else in the series comes close to the dynamic energy these four have when on screen together. But each of them are really great on their own. Zidane is such a good-natured and optimistic character. He's bright and cheerful, quick to make a joke, and has a big heart. Garnet's quest for truth, both inside herself and in the outside world, is endlessly relatable. Vivi is an adorable scamp with a beautifully tragic existential crisis. And Steiner, though he offers plenty of great comic relief with his bumbling boasting, is ultimately incredibly endearing and full of heart as well. Freya is another great character full of personality and charm. Her backstory is tragic and heartbreaking, but her character development ends almost as quickly as it begins, and she quickly moves to the sidelines after the game took a great deal of time building up her character. It's frustrating to see such great setup not be paid off. Beatrix is possibly the best guest character in the series. She ends up getting more development than Freya, and is in many ways a hybrid of Cecil from Final Fantasy IV and Celis from Final Fantasy VI. Her arc of redemption over her past actions as a brutal arm of the Empire is great, as is her budding romance with Steiner. 
It's a real shame she isn't a permanent party member, because she gets more development than some of them. There's a mod that lets you add her as a permanent party member that's been on my to playlist for quite some time, but I think that's a perfect addition to the game. Aiko is one of the best kid characters in the series. Her sense of loneliness and isolation is palpable, and you can see how she would cling to the party upon their arrival. She ultimately gets fleshed out better than Freya, despite Freya having a far stronger introduction. Kina is probably the best comic relief character in the series. Despite not needing more development than Freya, for some reason he slash she gets more development and way more screen time. I'm not complaining in this regard, mind you, as Kina is consistently laugh out loud funny throughout the entire adventure, and a serious competition for the starting four in terms of charm. But then there's Amarant, who is ultimately a pretty weak character, and I mean that in two senses. Amarant is both weak in terms of writing and also in terms of the in-game lore. You're introduced to Amarant when he's hired as a mercenary to take out the party members, but he loses to Zidane in one-on-one -on -one combat. Zidane shows mercy on Amarant, and Amarant decides to join the party so he can follow Zidane and understand how someone so strong can also show mercy to others. He wants to learn what makes Zidane tick, and is supposed to act as a rival character, like Vegeta or Piccolo. But then we learn his backstory. Amarant used to be a low-level security guard, and one night he got tricked by Zidane, who ended up stealing riches from the mansion Amarant was supposed to be guarding. He then lost his job and reputation, and was forced into becoming a black market mercenary all because of a Tom and Jerry-esque bait and switch. He's an idiot. He acts tough and badass, and the game wants to portray him that way, but he's clearly incompetent and you wipe the floor with him when you first fight him. Later in the game, he goes off on his own to prove he's tough, and he immediately ends up getting injured and needs to be saved. The devs clearly wanted to make a Ken, but they ended up making a Dan. Nine, more than other games in the series, really does a lot with supporting cast members just outside of the purview of the party. The Tantalus crew gets a decent amount of screen time, as does the lovable Dr. Tot, and of course Beatrix. Three members of the Tantalus crew become temporary guest characters. Senna is only playable at the very beginning of the game, but both Blank and Marcus help fill out the party at interesting points in the story, adding to the richness of the experience. Blank, in particular, feels weird that he doesn't become a permanent party member because he actually hangs out on the ship with the party later in the game. One could argue that since he's acting as pilot, he can't leave his station, but come on. It's also pretty clear that Makoto was probably supposed to be a party member, but likely got cut due to time constraints with the development cycle. While the game and characters feel mostly complete, one could imagine if the game had an extra six months, we would have had a more satisfying continuation of Freya's story and an additional party member in Makoto. The cast of Nine has some imperfections and doesn't have the flawless execution of Ten's cast. No one in Ten's cast is a weak link, and there's something to be said about that. But nobody in Ten can hold a candle to the combo of Zidane, Vivi, Garnet, and Steiner. Nine has the most charming cast in the main series. While it would be nice if characters like Freya, Beatrix, Amarant, and Makoto were handled a little better, everyone else is aces, and the strength of the character dynamics simply can't be touched. What the cast of Nine gets right, it really gets right, and it makes up for any minor imperfections it may have, and thus rightfully earns the number 3 spot on this list. Number 2 Final Fantasy 4 I remember reading something online about the development of Final Fantasy 7 and the creation of the characters in that game. Apparently whenever Square had released an RPG after Final Fantasy IV, the feedback and fan mail they got from Japanese players was that the characters were good, but not Final Fantasy IV good. One of the goals with creating the cast of Final Fantasy VII was to get fans to stop talking about how much better the characters in IV were. It's possible this is one of those internet urban legends, but given the intense quality of the Final Fantasy IV cast, I don't find it too hard to believe. While fans in the West generally prefer the cast of VI to IV, I think that it's not even a close contest between the two, and I give the edge to IV by a wide margin. Cecil Harvey is arguably the first really great protagonist in a JRPG. His arc of redemption, going from Dark Knight to Paladin, is legendary at this point. His very human desire to right his past wrongs is incredibly relatable, and he serves as a fantastic anchor character to this incredible tale. But there's so much more to this cast than just Cecil. There's the sage Tella, with his suicidal one-sided quest for revenge. He's on a path to destruction, and there's nothing anyone can say or do to stop him, and he's such a well-fleshed out character. His hatred feels visceral and real. Edward, in contrast, shows another way that one might respond to grief. Seeing his journey to move past his cowardice and be a hero in the small ways he is able to is inspiring, showing even the weakest among us can make a difference. Rydia's journey is one of childhood tragedy. Those of us who experience trauma in early childhood can often relate to the concept of having to grow up too soon, and let's just say the game addresses this concept in more ways than one. Rosa offers something fresh in regards to JRPG romance in that she was already in a relationship with Cecil prior to the events of the game. It's nice to see a healthy, supportive relationship on display without any melodrama. Cecil and Rosa love each other, communicate their feelings, and treat each other well. 
There's something to be said about her lacking more agency as a character, but given that the original script had to be cut down by 75% due to storage restrictions, I'm willing to give that aspect of her character a pass. The fact that young boys and girls playing Final Fantasy IV for the first time were able to see a healthy relationship based on mutual respect and communication is a positive in my book, even if more could be done with her character. Kane, best friend and rival to Cecil, has become one of the most iconic characters in the series. His battle between the seduction of darkness, his primal desires, and his attempts to rise above them to be the hero he knows he can be is continually engaging and exciting. Palam and Porum are full of charm and personality, wit and humor, offering levity at the exact time it is desperately needed, while being strong enough in their writing to offer one of the most dramatic and heartbreaking moments in the game. Yang, the honorable warrior, always doing what is right no matter the cost it may take upon him and his body, is the epitome of the stoic hero but even he is able to pull off some great comedy slapstick with his wife. As progressive as Cecil and Rosa's relationship may have been for that era of video gaming, Yang's romantic life was clearly just there for the lulls, and that's fine too. Then you have Edge, the womanizer ninja prince learning to become a leader, raising his kingdom from the ashes and learning there's more to life than revenge. He's ultimately able to learn the lesson that Tella, in his old age, could not. And Sid. In many ways, the Sid from Final Fantasy IV has every aspect we want from a Sid. He's rough around the edges, but he has a big ol' heart, despite some of his off-color commentary. And of course, he loves airships and machines, because he's a Sid. There's also Fusaya, the mysterious mystic from another world, and key to bringing together the puzzle pieces of the narrative. The cast of Final Fantasy IV is incredibly stacked. There's not a weak link in the group, at least narratively. Each party member has a distinct personality, design, and vastly different gameplay style, further adding to the individuality of each cast member. They add so much charm to Final Fantasy IV despite the darker tale the game weaves. The bar was set incredibly high in Final Fantasy IV, and for my money, only one cast was able to top them. Number 1, Final Fantasy VII Final Fantasy VII has the most iconic cast in the entire series and it's not even close. But iconic doesn't automatically equal quality, and I acknowledge that. There are a lot of people who have stated that the cast of VII isn't even good and that everyone is a one-dimensional anime stereotype. I vastly disagree. Every single party member is great, and the cast have much more nuance than the haters are willing to give them credit for. Let's begin with Cloud. He's the main character, and in many games, the main character is someone learning to become a hero. They're the inexperienced one figuring out the world as the stand-in for the player. But Cloud isn't that. He's the ace. He's the expert. He's the competent one who gets things done. He's the one who does the explaining to other characters. He's confident and cool, but there's something off. Cloud is an unreliable narrator. And as we journey through the game, we discover who he truly is. As he accepts his truth and becomes whole, it offers us a great metaphor for our own lives to look at the parts of us inside of us we want to run away from, and how if we confront them, we can find our true selves and come out the other end even stronger. He's not just an anime emo boy. Advent Children and the compilation may have ruined his reputation, but luckily Remake reminded everyone what a great, great, great character Cloud is. There are those who argue Barrett is just a Mr. T clone, a racist stereotype and nothing more. I've discussed Barrett with black friends of mine, and they've all pretty much said the same thing to me. They argue just because a black character talks like a black person doesn't mean the character is racist, but rather it's racist to automatically assume the character is a one-dimensional stereotype because of nothing more than a rough and gruff speech pattern. Barrett is a terrorist driven by a desire for revenge. He wraps his lust for violence and ideology about saving the planet, but he knows that's just flowery propaganda to help him get his vengeance, and not his primary motivator. But even with his hatred and anger, his heart is still full of love, and he's an incredibly loving and caring father to his adopted daughter Marlene. It doesn't matter she's not his biological child or that they have different skin tones. Marlene is his daughter and he loves her with all his heart. Barrett, as hell-bent for revenge as he may be, is willing to die for those he loves. He's far from a one-dimensional stereotype. He's complex, layered, and nuanced. He's black and talks the way many black people do. I obviously don't intend to speak on behalf of people of color, and if somebody wants to be offended by Barrett's portrayal, it's not my place to tell them what they should feel. But I think there's too much layer and nuance to Barrett as a character to simply write him off for his speech pattern. He's one of the best written characters in video game history. Tifa, the childhood friend of Cloud, senses something is off with her old companion, but she doesn't have the heart or the nerve to get to the bottom of the issues she senses. She is an enabler, and would rather lie and placate her friend than confront the truth, which is very, very human. The way their relationship evolves from unhealthy enabling to a healthy support structure is beautiful. To some, she's just eye candy with large breasts and a short skirt, but she's so much more than that. She's a compassionate soul trying to do the right thing and constantly feeling conflicted about the actions she takes. 
Aerith gets stereotyped as being more of an ideal than an actual person, but that's only for those who have never experienced the game. She's not just a damsel with a generic healer personality. She's fun, flirty, a little sassy, but yes, she's also compassionate and caring. She's an actual person with thoughts, desires, hopes, aspirations, dreams, and goals. She's quick to crack a joke and try to lift the spirits of those around her because she likes bringing joy, even in the darkest of times. Red 13 learns the importance of forgiving those who have wronged you in the past. His journey is one of maturity, letting go of preconceived notions when new information is provided, and letting go of anger and resentment. Yuffie offers plenty of comic relief in her greed, but you can see how her environment shaped her personality. She is the product of stifled nationalism, ashamed of her countrymen for losing all sense of pride and dignity as they are humiliated on the world stage. Her patriotism and desire to bring glory back to her people, hashtag make Wutai great again, leads her to radicalism. She's a fiery youth caught up in a desire for political revolution, and she, like many of us who are political at a young age, learns to develop her politics and decides which lines she is unwilling to cross in her desire for national glory. Vincent experienced intense trauma in his past and became isolated from all of society, hiding away in the darkness until a request for his aid came. His vampire motifs implies that returning to the light would harm him, but he does so anyway, because his reintroduction to society is more important than the anxieties he may have about his past. Katsi offers the foil to Barrett, the man inside the system who tries to reform from within and rightfully criticizes the more violent extremism and the innocents hurt along the way. It's argued that he's not able to accomplish much, and thus the marrying of the radical and the centrist in order to execute lasting change is a lesson he must come to grips with. And Sid, a man who shows what can happen to a jaded dreamer after years and years of failure. Sid's life seems to have passed him by, and while at one point he may have had youthful optimism like Yuffie, the constant and continual failures in his life wore down his spirit to the point where he began to use substances to numb his emotional pain, and began to verbally abuse those around him in his bitter resentment. He is a cautionary tale, but also a hopeful one, because his arc shows there is a way to come back from the depths of his abject failure, and that it's never too late to turn things around. Each character is great individually, but together they work even better. The love triangle between Cloud, Aerith, and Tifa is the best in video games. You can feel the tension between Cloud's affection for both of them, and because Tifa and Aerith become genuine friends, another great layer is added to the dynamic, as neither of them wants the other party to be hurt. Cloud and Barrett learn to begrudgingly respect one another. Barrett and Katzi's ethical values clash. The cast is dynamic and lively, diverse and varied, but they're able to come together as a family and save the world. Fast and Furious has nothing on the Final Fantasy VII gang. Generic anime characters? Far from it. The cast of Final Fantasy VII is incredible. Each character is top tier, best of the best for the JRPG genre, and together they create an alchemy that cannot be topped. If the goal for creating the cast of VII was to get fans to shut up about how great the cast of IV is, it worked. And now the Seven fans are the ones who won't shut up about how great the characters are. But with a cast like this, can you really blame them? Final Fantasy VII's cast of characters is the best in the series, and because of that, they take the number one spot in this ranking. Thanks for watching this video. Again, these lists are my personal opinion, and I'm definitely curious to see you guys posting your rankings in the comments below. Be sure to do the YouTube things, the liking, the subscribing, etc. And if you like this video, don't forget to check out the other rankings in the series. Thanks for watching, and I hope you find peace and happiness in your life. Cheers!